In the name of the Creator, Redeemer and Sanctifier. Amen. Please be seated. We're now in the third week of our sermon series, Paraclesis, Journeying Together. So far we've looked at that idea of caring and loving. Now this week we're going to look all about uh, journeying. Today we're going to explore what does it mean to journey alongside someone else. The Gospel accounts show us that Jesus continually journeyed with others, not just the disciples as he travelled throughout Israel, preaching and teaching and healing, but he also journeyed with others from Jerusalem to Galilee, Jericho to Capernaum. He encountered people like Nicodemus, Zacchaeus, the woman at the well and many others. When he did, he stopped to get alongside them as they opened up their lives to him. John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress, is an allegory of the journey of life and its struggles. Very often when we face those struggles, we need someone to journey with us. Life has its ups and downs, right? Right? Yes, thank you. (laughs) We all know that. Job phrases it this way. But human beings are born to trouble just as sparks fly upwards. It's a little bit pessimistic, isn't it? It's true, though. God can use us to show hope to others in those situations. Just joining someone else in their journey can give them hope. It tells them you're not alone. Someone's willing to journey alongside you. Psalm 23 ultimately is a journey psalm. The psalmist, facing hardship, knew he wasn't alone when he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. The psalmist saw that God was guiding, directing, supporting and journeying with him. It begins, that famous psalm, with that line, The Lord is my shepherd. Our key verse in this series is 2 Corinthians 1.4. And it says that God comes alongside us in our hard times. And when God does, God gives us something, makes a deposit with us, into us for us to use in coming alongside someone else in their journey. Your journey, the ups and downs, the valleys, the hard times, has significance not just for your life, but for what it can be to someone else's life. We tend to talk in church a lot about gifts, don't we? Gifts of the spirit, personal gifts, spiritual gifts, natural gifts, gifts we've honed over time. But there's a neglected, overlooked gift in our church. A gift we bring to church every week and we take home again every week, week in and week out. That gift is the gift of our resource of journey, the life we've been through, our life experiences, the events and the circumstances we've faced and overcome. They can be a resource, not just in our own lives, but if we let them, They can be a resource as we come alongside someone else facing a similar event or circumstance. Take a church like this. Over the course of a week, we would have somewhere around 150 people that we'd encounter. An average, let's give us all an average age of 70. I know you're all gonna say, oh, but Christian, you're much younger than that. Thank you. I appreciate that. But everybody else tells me they're so much older and they can't. So we're going to go with an average of 70, right? Happy with that? So 150 people with an average of 70 years, we have over 10,000 years of life experience in this parish. If we allow God to release the gift of those 10,000 years to each other and to those beyond the walls of this church into the community, Imagine the impact we can have. Many of us have heard a famous line from Forrest Gump. My mama always says, yeah, no, you can't do it without the accent, can you? (laughs) Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. It's true, isn't it? In the Greek, 
the hard times in, one, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 means pressing, squeezing or pressure. It refers to life's struggles. Jesus refers to it in John chapter 16 verse 21, but he uses a completely different analogy. He uses the analogy of a woman in childbirth. And he uses that illustration, I think, to show us that out of that struggle comes life. From hard times can come life and purpose and vitality and healing for others. St Paul phrases it in 1 Thessalonians, gently encourage the stragglers, he says. Reach out for the exhausted, pulling them to their feet. Be patient with each person, attentive to individual needs. Let's go back to our word paraclesis. We translated it as coming together. We also, in our first week, translated it as encouragement. There's another way we translate, translate it as well, and that is consolation. In fact, the first time the word paraclesis is used in the New Testament, it's actually all about consolation. In Luke 2.25, when Mary and Joseph, take, according to the law, they take Jesus as a baby to the temple, they present him at the temple, there was a man there called Simeon. And the scripture says about Simeon, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Consolation, the word is actually in Greek, Paraclesis. He was waiting for the paraclesis of Israel. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians 1 5, our consolation, paraclesis, abounds through Christ. Put all that together. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, the one who comes alongside and brings us consolation, brings us calm and peace, easing and soothing of hurt, finding rest and giving hope. Of course, the opposite of consolation is what? Disconsolation. Bit of an old-fashioned word, that, isn't it? Depression. It's got to do with loss, grief, sorrow, disappointment, failure and hopelessness. We console the sad, the bereaved, the heartbroken, the distressed, the dejected, the disillusioned and the downcast. In our Gospel passage today, Luke 24, Jesus joins the journey of two dejected, disillusioned, downcast, disconsolate disciples. Nice alliteration, right? This story of Jesus journeying with them is the pattern for journeying alongside, the way Jesus does it. So it begins. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. For those that don't know what a mile is, it's about seven miles, about 10 kilometres, 10 to 11 kilometres, something like that, maybe a touch more than 11. What does it say? The same day. What day is that? The day of resurrection. Jesus raised to new life that very day these disconsolate disciples were heading back home. I think it's hugely significant that the first ministry act of the risen Lord is to come alongside and bring consolation to two disconsolate disciples. I wonder if that might be setting something of a priority for the kingdom of God into the role that journeying with people in trouble means. So what exactly did Jesus do on this journey? The first thing he does is he connects with their story. They were telling their story, but not just the moment. They're not just talking about as we walk along, we're sad and look at the birds and all of that. They are connecting it with what has happened to them, their backstory. The truth is whenever we journey with someone, it might be a moment, but there's always a story behind it. The disciples talk about a living memory for them and their present reality. They'd been longing for and hoping for years after centuries of depression, this man, Jesus, would be the saviour and deliverer of Israel. This was their dream, their hope. But they'd seen that dream and hope die on a cross and be buried in a tomb. They were speaking all the language of despair and they were trying to make sense of it, they were confused. 
when we encounter those moments of confusion and struggle, we tend to play things over and over and again in our minds. Or at least I know I do. Anyone else? Psychologists call that our inner monologue, our self-talk. What do we tell ourselves about these events over and over again? Journeying with someone allows them to talk that inner monologue out and it can be the beginning of consolation. The second thing that Jesus does is to connect with them and commit to them. He approaches them and joins them, becoming part of their journey. He was in it for the long haul though. It quite literally was not a 10 yard dash. He didn't join them and say, I'm just going to jog with you to that tree. He sticks with them for seven miles. That probably took a couple of hours to walk. He gently catches up, falls in step with them. Journeying alongside someone starts by showing up and being there. Not wanting to just talk about ourselves and not wanting to take over. The truth is our presence alone is half the journey of care that God wants us to bring to someone else. The next thing that Jesus does with them is to build rapport with them. They were deep in conversation. And Jesus walks up and jumps in front of them, throws his hands up in the air and says, Hey guys, here I am, risen from the dead. Doesn't do that, does he? He could have done that. It would have been true, wouldn't it? But he did something else instead. He listened to them. He built rapport with them. There's something about, I think, his quiet, calm and soothing presence there. Consolation is the first step of journeying, being there, journeying alongside and bringing, and in this instance, being the peace of God to those two disciples. Then he moves on to start listening to their story. And he starts that by using a door opener. What are you discussing with each other? He asks. Nice open-ended question. What are you talking about? And they answer. Are you the only one that doesn't know what's going on? And his next question just opens that door a little wider. What things? Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hunch that Jesus knew exactly what those things were. He, he was somehow intimately involved in them all. He could have just skipped through and not asked that question. Instead, he says, what things? He lets them lay out their experience in front of them. Do you think he asked that because he didn't know the answer or because he wanted to hear their version of it? Give them the opportunity to talk it out. The next thing he does is express empathy for them. He just listens to all they have to say, to here's everything that's happening, here's what we believe about it. He says nothing. I suspect he's watching them, listening to the words, watching their body language, looking at all the signals they're giving off, probably uses some reflective listening, inviting them to go deeper. When we come alongside someone else, we need to be careful. We need to be warm, genuine, attentive. We can be just like Jesus, not be intrusive, but allow others the time to express what they're going through. We can use a door opener, an open question, just to invite someone to keep going. Ultimately, what Jesus does is let them tell their story. They're probably halfway through their journey by now. When you journey with someone, it takes time to let them tell their story and unburden their heart. The disciples clearly want this stranger to know and understand their broken world. And Jesus does not cut them short, but continues to listen to their story. We can look back on it and say, well, he knew the answer. He is the answer, but he wants them to discover it. He could have imposed it on them as soon as he met them. But instead, he understands the importance of the process of that journey and the time it takes. He walks with them, listening to them. And now he gets to the bigger story. See, what he's done is he's listened to their experiences and now he is this sounds like a made-up word, care-fronting. It sounds like, a, and I know all words are made up, 
but this is actually where it's been around for a couple of decades now. Care fronting is a term used to describe caring enough to confront. Definitions up on the screen. Care fronting is showing care and concern for the individual, not just challenging the issue. It's not so much trying to change the person but trying to help them see themselves and their circumstance more accurately. By care fronting, Jesus has earned the right to speak. Having taken time to understand and feel their pain and show respect, Jesus earns the right to speak. And they were willing to listen to what he has to say now. We cannot speak effectively unless we understand how people feel. Otherwise, all we're doing is confronting. When we feel understood, that's when we listen. The second thing by care fronting Jesus does is he helps them to face reality. The English makes this sound much more confrontational than what it is. Oh foolish ones and slow of heart. Sounds confronting, doesn't it? And we often interpret it in English as you stupid idiots. That's not what it meant, though. It just means a lack of understanding. J.B. Phillips translated it as, aren't you failing to understand and slow to believe? See, Jesus wants them to understand the reality of their circumstance. This is the confronting part of it, but he's cared enough to listen to tell them a truth now. His starting point was to use something familiar for them, let me explain using all the prophets. The third thing he does is he focuses on perspective and hope. The disciples in that moment have two problems. A head problem, a loss of perspective, and a heart problem, that lack of belief and loss of hope. Hope directly relates to perspective. Knowing they're familiar with the prophets, Jesus takes that inner monologue they've got working their subjective reality, what we understand alone, and he relates it to the truth expressed through the prophets and his own life. If you've walked with God and God has brought grace and truth to you in your struggle, that's when we find perspective and hope. To help the disciples see the bigger story, Jesus brings grace and truth to them. He's been gracious. Let grace flow toward the disciples. Now he brings truth. In the prologue of John's Gospel, that great hymn at the start of John's Gospel, one of my favourite lines in that is, we have beheld his glory full of grace and truth. Grace comes before truth. When we take the time to let grace flow by walking and journeying with someone, then out of that can come truth not a truth we impose from above. Here in this story, Jesus wasn't giving them, let me give you the Old Testament history lesson. I'm going to take you to an exegesis of the Old Testament prophets. He talks about their reality, their circumstances. And then he talks about his reality, his circumstances and suffering. He links their story with God's story. Isn't that ultimately what St Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1.4? He comes alongside, he brings alongside us alongside someone else so that we can be there for that person with grace and truth, just as God was there with grace and truth. Jesus models exactly what we're talking about, coming alongside, listening to their story, bringing grace into that, and then speaks truth into it. And that gives for the disciples perspective and hope. And that surely is at the heart of our journeying. The other thing he does is he ministers to their need. Seven miles they've walked together. They've journeyed with Jesus. And despite that long amount of time that they've already spent together, they're not ready to part when they get to the destination. And Jesus looks like he's going on. They urged him strongly, it says, I understand that the Greek is more along the lines of they constrained him. They crash tackled him. I don't know if they actually did that, but wouldn't it have been cool if they did? They constrained him from going on. 
Something was happening for them. In that journey, he had become a caring friend, a supportive companion, gaining their confidence and trust. The risen Christ, full of grace and truth, has been pouring himself into their lives and now they're connected with this stranger. They want to hang out with him. Now they're no longer journeying, but they're sitting, communing with him, sharing grace and truth. And in that moment, it brings Jesus brings enlightenment. He takes the bread and breaks it. And then he's gone. Realisation dawns in the eyes of the disciples. It's that aha moment. Ah, I see who he was. In the breaking of the bread, their eyes are opened. They see the light. They look at each other. And what do they do? Well, let's go over the lesson he gave us in exegesis. They don't say that, do they? What do they say instead? Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? They reflected back on their journey. They didn't compare notes. They compared hearts. They'd received a visitation of divine light and divine heart. They didn't just see something. They felt something. Hope was restored and disconsolation faded and they felt their hearts burn. Ultimately, what this does is Jesus re-energises them. As that enlightenment dawns in their spirit, they suddenly realise there are people back in Jerusalem who are as disconsolate as they were when they set out on that journey. But they are seven miles away. What do you do when you've walked seven miles? Can I tell you what I do? I look for food and then bed. But they couldn't. They couldn't rest. With their hope restored, their perspective changed, their spirits energised, their hearts on fire, they get up from the table and they head back seven miles to Jerusalem. Two grown men whose lives just a few hours ago had been full of disconsolation in a downward spiral they're transformed by the power and presence of Jesus in the process of a journey. Their hearts, which were burnt, are now bursting. They journeyed now with hope and they are transported with joy. All is not lost. And what do they do? Almost fulfilling what 2 Corinthians says, they then go back to tell their story to others to bring consolation to those who don't have it. Jesus is ultimately the centre of this story. He comes alongside us at the cross, forgave our sin and guilt, but did not leave us there. What he did in that moment was also put us on a journey of coming alongside others with grace and truth that he's given to us. If you've received any measure of grace and truth in your experience, God calls you to take that resource to journey with others. That is the Jesus model of paraclesis. And this type of journey, and it's not just for today, it's not just what we do in this church, and it's not just what we do with the 150-odd people of this church. If everyone took this to heart and we started journeying with just two people every week, that would mean our church is journeying with 300 people from Monday to Saturday. And if those people happen to not be part of this church but out there in the world, then this ministry of paraclesis would not just be working to make us stronger, but it would be working out there in the world. My prayer is that God may quicken your heart with the possibility and the potential of your journey and your life experience. Because after today, you can never again say, that I've got nothing to bring to someone else. You have a gift. You are a gift. Don't bury it. Don't just bring it to church just to take it home again. Ask God to use it in the lives of others. Let Jesus be who he is to us and through us as we connect our story 
and the story of others with God's story. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.